topic of this video is photosynthesis. Uh, photosynthesis takes place primarily in plant cells, uh, and that's what we're going to be discussing in this course. But realize it can also occur in some algae and also in cyanobacteria uh, as well. In fact, the majority of the oxygen in the atmosphere that you breathe is from algae in the ocean. So the purpose of photosynthesis is for the plant cell to make a particular type of molecule uh, called G3P. Think about G3P almost like a set of Legos. <clears throat> so those molecules can be combined to build other molecules, uh, including glucose, which is the most common uh, thing that's made from G3P. But it can also, the plant can also use G3P to make things like cellulose for structural support um, or proteins or things like that. And, uh, and this raises an interesting point. Plants are able to make their own food. So they make it through photosynthesis, and then they use that in cellular respiration in the cells. So they don't go through this process for us to make oxygen for us. They do it to make food for themselves, and then we benefit from the oxygen released as waste product, just like they benefit from the carbon dioxide that we release <clears throat> as a waste product from cellular respiration. The chemical equation is pretty much the opposite of cellular respiration uh, other than the type of energy that's used. So in cellular respiration, we started with glucose and oxygen and ended up with carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of ATP. In photosynthesis, the plant starts with carbon dioxide and water with an input of solar energy and ends up with glucose and oxygen. Notice that we use glucose rather than G3P in this equation. Um, that's because we're trying to make it easier to understand and balance, and most of the G3P produced immediately becomes glucose in the cell. So how exactly does this work? Well, uh, plants take in carbon dioxide from the air through tiny holes in their surface called stomata. <clears throat> you can see two microscopic views of the stomata here. The one on top is a wafer-thin slice that has been put on a slide and then stained, and now it's being looked at through a normal microscope. So it's in 2D, basically. Um, the one on the bottom is from a scanning electron microscope, so it's more of a, a 3D type image. Uh, the stomata are controlled through guard cells that line the openings and determine whether the holes are going to be opened or closed. Plants take in water and other necessary nutrients, like minerals, through their roots. Uh, cohesion, or the clinging of water molecules to themselves, helps in the movement of water up the plant from the roots. Plants absorb solar energy from the sun through special pigments in their cells. The most widely spread of these is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll absorbs all colors of light other than green. It actually reflects green, which is why uh, most plants appear green to our eyes. We're perceiving the reflected light. Chlorophyll pigment is found in chloroplasts, which are small green organelles found in plant cells. The picture at the lower right shows a microscopic view of plant cells filled with chloroplasts. The process itself encompasses two steps. The best way to remember this is to look at the word itself. So the first part of the word is photo. Uh, photo or photon typically indicates light, so the first step uh, are the light reactions. These require sunlight to take place. The second part of the word is synthesis, which means to create something, and the second step of photosynthesis is the Calvin cycle, where glucose or G3P uh, is made. The light reactions take place in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. This is where the chlorophyll pigments are located, among other things. During the light reaction, solar energy is absorbed and used to energize electrons. Those electrons go through an electron transport chain, uh, very similar to the one that we looked at um, in the mitochondrion during cellular respiration. So just like in the mitochondrion, ATP is produced through chemiosmosis, which you'll recall involves a hydrogen ion gradient and an enzyme called ATP synthase. Um, NADP+, accepts electrons and becomes NADPH. So remember in cellular respiration we had a molecule called NAD+, but in photosynthesis in the plant cell it's NADP+. But both of them are electron carrier molecules, so they, they take electrons and a hydrogen ion and they can carry it to other places in the cell. The ATP and the NADPH that are formed in the light reactions go into the Calvin cycle where absorbed carbon dioxide is converted into G3P 
by the use of the energy found in ATP and the electrons uh, from NADPH. So let's take a closer look at the light reactions. These take place on the membrane of the thylakoid. Light energy in the form of photons is striking the chlorophyll molecules. Uh, it's then going to bounce around until it hits the reaction center, which is uh, a bit like a springboard um, that bounces the electron up and out of photosystem 2 and into an electron transport chain very similar to the one found in the mitochondria of cellular respiration. Water is split to donate electrons back into photosystem 2 to replace the ones that it lost. Oxygen is released as a byproduct of this, and the hydrogen ions go towards the hydrogen ion gradient that is created through the movement of electrons through the electron transport chain. ATP is created through the enzyme ATP synthase, which is not found in this picture, not labeled in this picture, um, just like in cellular respiration. So after passing through the electron transport chain, the electrons are then donated to photosystem 1. Photosystem 1's chlorophyll pigments also absorb light energy in the form of photons, and they end up giving that energy to the electrons in the reaction center, which are then bounced up to NADP+. NADP+, accepts the electrons and a hydrogen ion to become NADPH. So one thing that can be a little bit confusing to students with this is that photosystem 2 actually comes before photosystem 1. And that's because photosystem 1 was discovered first by scientists before photosystem 2. So they, they numbered them in the order of their discovery, not necessarily in the order of the reaction. So the, the path of the electrons is photosystem 2, electron transport chain, photosystem 1, and then NADP+. So here's another look at the light reactions with a little bit more detail shown. Um, you can see photosystem 2, uh, which is indicated by the red arrow sitting in the membrane. Light hits the photosystem and energizes electrons. Those electrons pass down several proteins uh, to photosystem 1, generating a hydrogen ion gradient inside the membrane space as they pass. Water split, generating more hydrogen ions and donating electrons to replenish photosystem 2. Oxygen is released and diffuses out of the cell. Photosystem 1 accepts light energy to energize its electrons and then donates them to a protein that will attach them to NADP+, thereby making NADPH, which will then carry those electrons to the Calvin cycle. The hydrogen ions pass through ATP synthase, uh, shown there at the bottom by the blue arrow, ATP synthase uses the energy generated by the flow of hydrogen ions to attach a phosphate group to ADP, therefore thereby making ATP. So both the ATP and the NADPH will now move on to the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle takes place in the stroma of the chloroplasts. It consists of three phases that are repeated over and over again in a cycle. So in the first phase, carbon dioxide reacts with a molecule called RUBP. Uh, a particular enzyme, Rubisco, facilitates this reaction. In the second phase, the six carbon molecule that was generated from the previous reaction goes through a series of changes to make G3P, uh, which remember that's a type of simple sugar molecule. ATP and NADPH are used in this phase to help with these changes. In the final part, some of the G3P molecules are used to go back and regenerate RUBP. The leftover G3P molecules go into the cell and are used to make glucose, among other things. G3P is made up of three carbons, so often this type of photosynthesis is called C3 photosynthesis. So remember, photosynthesis, the kind of the summary here, uh, you're using carbon dioxide, water, and solar energy to make glucose, uh, specifically a G3P molecule, but glucose. That glucose will be used by the plant cell for cellular respiration to generate ATP for everyday metabolism, and then oxygen is released as a byproduct. We use that oxygen for cellular respiration, as does the plant cell. All right, so there are some problems that can come up with photosynthesis, so let's discuss those just briefly. Recall that land plants bring in carbon dioxide through stomata, or those tiny openings on their surface. While those stomata are open, water will also evaporate out through the openings um, through a process called transpiration. Uh, think of perspiration, uh, like in people, except this is in plants, so it's called transpiration. So that water loss is compensated for by the roots, which are bringing in water from the soil. 
However, if it's really hot, if it's really hot and really dry, there is no way the plant can replace enough water from their roots to make it worthwhile um, for all that they're losing through the stomata. So actually, they'll close off their stomata. This leads to a whole other set of problems. So not only does closing the stomata prevent the plant cells from absorbing carbon dioxide and performing photosynthesis, it can also lead to an odd process called photorespiration. In photorespiration, Rubisco uses oxygen instead of CO2 as a substrate for the reaction that it catalyzes with RUVP. So this makes a compound called glycolate, um, which requires energy uh, for the cell to break it down, and it really doesn't have much of a useful purpose in the cell. It can't be used by the Calvin cycle, and it's acidic, so it can actually even further inhibit photosynthesis. So plants that are in hot and dry climates have two different mechanisms to help them cope with this problem. In C4 photosynthesis, enzymes scavenge CO2 to produce a 4-carbon sugar, even when the stomata are closed. The 4-carbon sugars act as a source of carbon dioxide for the Calvin cycle as needed. In CAM photosynthesis, water loss is slowed by opening the stomata only at night. So carbon dioxide is stored as an organic acid in the vacuole of the plant cell, and then the acids break down, releases carbon dioxide to the Calvin cycle during the day. All right, so hopefully that review is helpful on photosynthesis. Be sure to watch the animations that are found in the additional resources for this chapter because it will really show you um, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle reactions and help you understand those just a little bit more.